Good. Uh, so I wanted to add my welcome to Fermilab and uh, where we'll be spending the next few hours talking about the dark universe. Um, it, it's a big universe, lots to talk about. So to set the context though, I want to start by reminding you of a few basic facts about the universe that I think everyone should know. Uh, so the first fact is that the universe is very old. Does anyone know how old the universe is? 13.7. 13.7 billion. Good. All right. This is a good audience. Yes. Um, you've been reading ahead. Uh, or, or it's older than Bernie Sanders, either way. Um, that's it for the political jokes for the night. Uh, so it's actually 13.8 billion years. We, it's gotten older. Um, so how do we know it's old? Well, there are a number of things. It contains old things in it besides Bernie Sanders. Uh, the Earth, we know, is about 4.5 billion years old. The Sun, about 5 billion years. The oldest stars in our galaxy, about 13 billion years. And most recently, observations of the cosmic microwave background, which we'll talk a little bit about later, uh, have pinned it down to this 13.8 billion years. Uh, so this is just an example of some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. This is a globular star cluster, Omega Centaurus, uh, an image taken by the dark energy camera that I'll be talking about later, of stars that are about 13 billion years old. Second basic fact about the universe, it's very big. I'm not going to ask how big it is, uh, uh, because it's really big. Um, so the most distant objects we can see are about this many miles away. Uh, that's a lot of zeros. I think this is 100 zeta miles, if you look it up. Uh, and of course, when we get to such large distances, miles are not a very good unit of distance because it's just too many zeros to keep track of. So instead, we use the fact that light travels very quickly, 186,000 miles a second. Uh, so in one year, light travels 6 trillion miles. So that defines a unit of distance, a light year. Uh, and so this many miles, that many zeros up there, it corresponds to about 30 billion light years. So that's the most distant things we see are about 30 billion light years away. And just to set the scale, the sun, our nearest star, is, is about eight light minutes away. The nearest other stars near the sun are, are a few light years away. So the universe is very big. Third basic fact is the universe uh, contains billions of galaxies in it. So if you travel to the southern hemisphere, um, you have the advantage, if any of you have ever been down to the Southern Hemisphere, you go out on a dark night uh, when it's clear, uh, you can see galaxies with the naked eye. Uh, so just a little quiz. So this is a, a galaxy that we can actually see from the Northern Hemisphere too. Anybody know what this galaxy is? Milky Way, very good. All right, this is a, this is a very advanced audience, great. Uh, does anybody know what that galaxy is? Oh, wow, great. Small Magellanic Cloud, that's right. And this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. These are two dwarf galaxy satellites of the Milky Way. You can only see them from the Southern Hemisphere, not from the North. So if you ever do go down South, I urge you to go out in a dark night and uh, see if you can see them. They're quite, quite spectacular. So these are examples of nearby galaxies. Uh, and the universe is filled with billions of these galaxies. This is a more typical galaxy. Um, and it's a, they're typically about 60,000 light years across, contain tens of billions of stars, uh, and they rotate like this, this galaxy, like our own Milky Way, rotates around its center uh, with a, uh, on an average, takes about 200 million years to complete one rotation. This is also an image taken with our, our camera. So um, if we can bring the maybe lights down just a little bit, I want to show you uh, a few examples of some uh, pretty galaxies that we've taken pictures of uh, with the dark energy camera. This is NGC 253. I'm sure you all knew that um, in the Constellation Sculptor. And this is, of course, the familiar NGC 1566. Um, also, these galaxies are a few tens of millions of light years away. Uh, so galaxies, uh, with, there are billions of them. They're all around the universe. But they don't exist in isolation. They live in and are shaped by a variety of environments uh, and in proximity to other galaxies with which they occasionally interact. So sort of like my teenage daughters occasionally interact with me. <laughs> galaxies occasionally interact with others. Uh, sometimes you find them in pairs or in groups or in clusters of tens to hundreds of thousands of galaxies. 
And those, those in themselves form part of a larger cosmic web of structure. We used to call these superclusters. Uh, so this is just one example here I pulled out. Uh, NGC 1672 is a nice uh, large uh, spiral galaxy in the foreground. But if you look down below here, you see a number of more distant, therefore they look smaller galaxies, in a group of galaxies. And this is sort of a, a, the first hint that these th galaxies are not just randomly distributed throughout space. They cluster together. Here's NGC 1703 in the foreground, but if we look a little closer, and if you look on the right to, of, of that galaxy, again, you see a lot of these smaller yellowish galaxies. That's a more distant cluster of galaxies that happens to be behind this foreground cluster. So galaxies clump together into pairs, groups, uh, and clusters of galaxies. This is a cluster of galaxies. Um, another image taken from the, uh, from the Dark Energy Survey. Again, all those yellowish galaxies are all in a relatively small volume of space, that being a few million light years across. Um, and they cluster together. This is a, a very famous cluster of galaxies. This, this isn't an image from our, our survey. Uh, the Coma Cluster of Galaxies. Uh, and gal again, clusters are sort of the largest gravitationally bound systems we know of in the universe. Uh, again, a few million light years across. Uh, and they contain about one quadrillion times the mass of the sun. So a thousand trillion times the mass of our sun, typically. Uh, and again, that's composed of tens to thousands of galaxies. Now, Coma is an extremely important cluster of galaxies historically because it was studied by this character, Fritz Zwicky, uh, was, a, was an astronomer uh, at Caltech in the first part of the 20th century. Um, and um, as you can probably tell from the image, uh, Zwicky was quite an, uh, a sort of irascible character. Uh, he was quite an eccentric personality, but he was also a pioneer of much of, of modern astronomy. He was one of the first to carry out a really major uh, surveys of, of galaxies. Uh, he also is the discoverer of dark matter, as we'll talk about in a minute. Possibly neutron stars did the first real quantitative studies of supernovae. And in the 1930s, um, Zwicky studied the motions of galaxies within that coma cluster. He measured how fast the galaxies were moving uh, with respect to us within the coma cluster. And he found that those galaxies were moving remarkably flat, fast of order of 1,000 kilometers per second relative to each other. And that was just simply too fast for them to remain confined by the gravitational field of the other galaxies in that cluster. Uh, so this was a puzzle. Why is the coma cluster still there? Why haven't those galaxies all just streamed away from each other if they're moving so fast relative to each other? And so what, uh, what Zwicky postulated was that the coma cluster, in addition to the luminous galaxies we could see, that coma was filled with dark matter. Uh, and that the, uh, this would, the gravity of that dark matter, the material that we can't see, must be the thing that's keeping the galaxies within the coma cluster from flying off into ex extra cluster space. Uh, so he really was the first one to study this concept in detail and concluded that clusters of galaxies are mostly made of dark matter. So an image like this, where we think we're looking at the cluster, we're really looking just at these galaxies that are kind of like sprinkles on this vast ice cream cone of dark matter. Uh, and we know the dark matter is there because it exerts this gravitational pull on the galaxies that we can see. All right, now we skip forward, and uh, using Einstein's theory of relativity, so I'll remind you that Einstein reinvented our notion of, of how gravity works through the concept that gravity is not just a force between two massive bodies. Instead, massive bodies or, or any kind of energy curves space-time in its vicinity, and other bodies move in that curved space-time, and that's how gravity gets communicated. And using that concept, then, uh, led Einstein to predict, and then the first real verification of his theory, was that uh, light rays should get bent in gravitational fields due to this curvature of space-time. And so what this means is, is if I look at a distant galaxy behind a foreground concentration of mass, say a cluster of galaxies, then the, the shape of that distant galaxy will get distorted because the light rays coming to us 
get bent by the gravitational field of that cluster. So something that's intrinsically elliptical, looking at the lower right-hand portion, uh, that's behind the cluster and near the line of sight to it, will get distorted into something that appears more like a banana or an arc. And this has now been observed uh, many times in uh, observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and from ground-based observatories. So what you're seeing here is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a cluster of galaxies. Those are the big, bright galaxies. But then you also see these faint, wispy, very elongated structures, these arcs. Uh, and those are images of distant galaxies behind the cluster. And the light has been bent passing through the cluster. And that leads to these very elongated apparent shapes. And you can use those images to actually reconstruct what the mass distribution of that cluster of galaxies is. And so these sharp peaks are uh, where the galaxies in the cluster are. But then in addition to those sharp peaks, you see this overall sort of mountain of matter. Uh, and that's all dark matter. That's a smoothly distributed dark matter in which these galaxies in that cluster are embedded. And so this is sort of direct confirmation of what, uh, of what Zwicky had found back in the 1930s. So skip forward now to the 1970s, and astronomers were studying the motions not only of galaxies within clusters, but of stars within individual galaxies. So this is the galaxy M33. It's a spiral galaxy similar to our Milky Way. It's rotating around its center. Uh, and you can measure the rotation speed of those stars around the center of the, the galaxy. This was done by Vera Rubin and collaborators in the 1970s. Uh, and what's shown here is a plot of the rotation speed in kilometers per second as a function of distance from the center of that galaxy M33. Now, what we expected is that as we move out from the center of the galaxy, the stars should be orbiting more and more slowly because once you get far enough out, there's no more mass. It's just you've enclosed all the stars. Uh, and so you would expect the rotation versus distance to look something like that lower dash line. And that's very much what the, the rotation curve of our solar system looks like, of planets moving around the sun. The farther the planets are away from the sun, the slower they're orbiting, because gravity is weaker. Instead, what Rubin and her collaborators found was that the rotation speed of stars around a galaxy keeps increasing and then sort of flattens out at a much higher value than would be expected just from the gravity of the stars contained within that galaxy. And this was, again, evidence that the bulk of the matter, of the, of the mass in, in this galaxy, was not contained in the stars that we see, but was, in fact, contained in some broader distribution of dark matter. And so, like Zwicky, Rubin found that the stars in a galaxy are moving faster than we can explain. The gravity of something that we can't see must be holding those stars in their orbits. Uh, and that's evidence for dark matter. And in fact, galaxies are mostly dark matter. The stars that we see in these galaxies are like, again, sprinkles on this much larger mass of dark matter ice cream. And again, we know it's there because of its gravitational effects. Again, skipping forward, just as we confirmed that fact in clusters of galaxies using gravitational lensing, we've also now confirmed the existence of dark matter in individual galaxies using the same gravitational lensing effect. So what you're seeing here are images of different galaxies, again, from the Hubble Space Telescope. The yellowish blobs in the center is a foreground galaxy. And those bluish rings are actually the highly distorted images of another galaxy behind that foreground galaxy. And it's been distorted because the light from that distance galaxy was bent around by the mass of the foreground galaxy. Uh, and that's that very high uh, um, lensing is, again, telling us about how much mass there is within the foreground galaxies. And it's much more than the mass contained in the stars. Here's another uh, example of this. This is actually a system we found with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and then followed up using the Hubble Space Telescope. So again, the yellowish blob in the center is a foreground galaxy. The blue ring around it is the highly distorted image of another galaxy that's behind it. 
Okay, and finally, we, can, we now do this on a kind of industrial scale, where we can apply that same technique of lensing to study the shapes of galaxies behind thousands of foreground galaxies and do this in a kind of average statistical sense. This is called galaxy-galaxy lensing. And instead of probing the masses of individual galaxies, this lets us probe the, the sort of typical mass of average galaxies. And so we started this, using this technique back in the 1990s. And what we found, again, was that on average, luminous galaxies are embedded in these extended, what we call halos, of dark matter. Uh, and so this was written up in the New York Times in late 1999. Uh, and apparently, we were very surprised by this finding. Uh, because that, you know, to make it interesting, for, uh, you have to, there has to be some element of drama. Um, <laughs> I was actually much more interested in the article on prehistoric fashion. That was, uh, that was the other article in the uh, newspaper that day. OK, so we've now established that dark matter exists. It's the dominant form of mass in galaxies and in clusters of galaxies. So the natural question is, what is dark matter made of? Um, is it made, so what, what, what could it be made of? Well, what, there's the stuff we know about in the universe. It's atoms, uh, which is made of electrons orbiting around a nucleus. The nucleus, more fundamentally, is made of protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons, more fundamentally, are made of quarks. Uh, and so you might think, OK, maybe dark matter is made of some kind of atom that just, for whatever reason, is not shining light or emitting or interacting with light in some way. So could, could dark matter be made of atoms, something that's very dark? And so in, the, in early times, people thought, OK, maybe there could be very faint stars that we just too faint to see, maybe planets that aren't illuminated by a nearby star, uh, maybe some kind of dirty rocks. Uh, and so astronomers searched for these. Uh, but we gradually concluded that there simply aren't enough atoms in the universe. Uh, to account for all of the dark matter that we infer in galaxies and clusters of galaxies. There's too much dark matter out there compared to the amount of atoms that we have added up in the universe that we've now measured very precisely. So dark matter must be made of something other than atoms or more fundamentally quarks, the things we study here at Fermilab. And perhaps uh, it's made of some new kind of elementary particle that we've never seen before that isn't, uh, you know, doesn't, uh, the atoms aren't composed of. And so our name for this uh, is a weakly interacting massive particle, or WIMP. Uh, and so a WIMP is basically some new kind of elementary particle. It might be, say, 10 to 100 times the mass of a proton, which is so weakly interacting that we don't see it. It doesn't shine. It doesn't uh, interact with light. Uh, but it could interact via the weak interaction with ordinary kinds of uh, ordinary atoms. And so there are experiments around the world, uh, cited deep underground, uh, filled with atoms, as you've seen here. Um, and they're looking for these WIMP particles coming from the dark halo of our galaxy. Uh, and the notion is that occasionally one of these WIMPs would come in, knock into the nucleus uh, in an atom in this detector, uh, and impart some energy into that nucleus, a very tiny amount. Uh, but if you have a sensitive enough detector, you can detect that, that energy that's deposited. Uh, and so there are a number of experiments now going around the world. Fermilab is as an active program uh, in searching for these dark matter, these WIMPs, using these techniques. There are a variety of different techniques. They all involve people uh, wearing funny hats. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an interesting field. There have been some of these experiments have claimed to have seen dark matter particles. Uh, others that we think are more sensitive have not yet seen them. So it's an interesting time. Uh, and these experiments are getting more and more sensitive. Uh, and there's a hope that in the next decade, perhaps, uh, we may actually detect uh, in, in, a, in a verifiable way these, these dark matter particles. Another possibility is that we may actually produce these dark matter particles. You've all heard of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, our sister laboratory in Switzerland, where the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012. They're bashing protons together at very unprecedentedly high energies. Uh, and the hope is that perhaps uh, in one of these collisions of protons, 
they may produce uh, dark matter particles, WIMPs, uh, that we could infer through their signatures in these, in these colliders. A third possibility for detecting dark matter is that we may see uh, WIMPs annihilating with each other. So our current theory suggests that if there are dark matter WIMPs, particles, there would also be antiparticles floating around in the halo of our galaxy. Uh, and whenever a, a WIMP particle and antiparticle come close together and collide, they would annihilate, giving off a burst of energy which would lead to radiation, high energy radiation, say gamma rays, uh, that we could see if we have a gamma ray observatory. Um, and uh, so NASA has such a gamma ray observatory orbiting the Earth, the Fermi Gamma Ray Satellite. And Fermi has been looking for signs of these WIMP, anti-WIMP annihilations, looking both at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, which is very dense, so there may be a lot of dark matter there, and also looking at uh, some of these other dwarf neighboring galaxies to the Milky Way, which are also very dense and would be places to look for this kind of annihilation signal. So Fermi is, is in the process of looking for gamma rays coming from WIMP annihilation. Okay, continuing on with the context setting the basic facts of our universe. The fourth fact is that the universe is expanding. <clears throat> and this is traced to the work of Edwin Hubble. Hubble was an astronomer in the first half of the, the last century. Uh, and we have to talk about him because he was a graduate of the University of Chicago. Both his undergraduate and graduate degrees were there. He also studied law. He was a boxer. He did track and field. Uh, he played basketball. In his spare time, he did astronomy. And uh, Hubble did some uh, really amazing feats in observational astronomy in the first part of the 20th century. He's the one who really proved that spiral nebulae, these wispy things, which we now call galaxies, he's the one who proved that they are actually galaxies outside of our own Milky Way. Before then, there had been great uncertainty whether these, these things, these nebulae, were actually clouds of stars uh, within our own galaxy. And he discovered the expanding universe in the late 1920s and went on to make important catalogs of galaxies and sky surveys. Um, so here's a picture of Hubble using the Palomar 48-inch telescope. Um, so has any, anybody noticed anything odd about this photograph of Hubble using the telescope? Well, he's looking, yeah, he's not looking through the telescope. He's looking through the viewfinder, but... Um, Yes, exactly. The lights are on. So to do astronomy, the lights have to be off. It has to be dark. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I sort of have my doubts about, you know, how authentic all this stuff really is because, you know, he should have known to turn the lights off. Anyway, uh, before that, Hubble uh, had a, uh, a, a quite stellar uh, athletic career. So here is Hubble with the 1909 National Championship NC, well, before the NCAA, I think. Uh, National Championship basketball team, 1909. Um, and here is actually Hubble's basketball, championship basketball, on the, on the space shuttle with the Hubble Space Telescope in the background. The final score of that championship game was University of Chicago 18, <laughs> Indiana 12. I think it took them a while before they, you know, Steph Curry hadn't been invented yet. Uh, they didn't have three-pointers back then, so nevertheless, uh, Hubble uh, really had, uh, went on to a brilliant career in astronomy, uh, and uh, to celebrate his career, um, astronomer John Grunsfeld, also a Chicago graduate, uh, brought his basketball up to, uh, on one of the missions where they uh, refurbished the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so here's the expanding universe as, as time goes on. Everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. If you were to run this movie backward in time, eventually everything would be on top of everything else. 13.8 billion years ago, that's what we call the Big Bang. And I want to just stress a few, a few key points about the expanding universe. One is we're really talking about uh, the distance between galaxies increasing. Uh, we don't think our galaxy is expanding. Uh, we don't think... This room is expanding. I'm expanding, but that's because I eat too much. 
Uh, generally, uh, you know, within our galaxy, gravity is keeping things sort of stable. Uh, so it's really the distance between galaxies which is increasing with time. And again, to give you a sense of scale, a galaxy 100 million light years away is moving away from us at 2,000 miles per second. So the universe is kind of humming along. Um, and um, uh, again, this was really established uh, by Hubble in the, in the late 1920s. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about the expanding universe. Uh, and often, many of these misconceptions are traced to the fact that this picture, while useful, we have to be cautious in interpreting it. Uh, because we're looking at a lower dimensional universe from our three-dimensional perspective. So we don't think the universe has a center or an edge, at least not that we can see. It looks the same everywhere. It's homogeneous and isotropic. And the expansion is happening everywhere. There's no, it's not exploding into empty space. And so really that picture of an expanding balloon is somewhat misleading. It's probably better to think of, say, an infinite raisin bread. Think of the raisins as galaxies. You put enough yeast into it and put it into the oven, and it will start to expand. Each raisin will move away from all of the other raisins. That's probably a better analogy for the expanding universe. Um, Another point to make is that as, as the universe expands, like any gas, uh, it gets less dense and it cools off. Therefore, if we run the movie backward in time toward the Big Bang, uh, it becomes hotter and denser. So today, the universe is very cold. It's only three degrees above absolute zero and very diffuse. The, the density of the universe is very low. Um, but in the early universe, it was much hotter and much denser. And so this is now uh, our best picture of the early universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is as seen from the Planck satellite. So this is an all-sky image of the temperature of the universe uh, as it appears today, um, three degrees above absolute zero. So the red and blue splotches are regions where the temperature is slightly hotter and slightly colder than the average. And that slight is only one part in 100,000. So the universe, to first approximation, has the same temperature everywhere, but it has these slight differences in temperature from one place to the other. Now, this is really giving us a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was only 380,000 years old. It's now 13.8 billion. So this is really a picture of the, of the adolescent universe. And at that time, it had a temperature of a few thousand degrees. But since then, with the expansion of the universe, it has cooled to a temperature of just below three degrees above zero. So this is a picture of what the universe looks like today. This is a map of galaxies uh, from an infrared survey done a number of years ago. Each of the little white uh, squares there is the location of, of a galaxy. Uh, there's uh, a few million galaxies in this picture. Uh, the blue is just, uh, this is in funny coordinates, so the blue is actually infrared emission from our own galaxy. Um, and again, what you show, what you see here is that the universe today is actually quite lumpy. Uh, it's not obvious that the, what the contrast is here, but the lumpiness of the universe today is, is orders of magnitude larger than it was uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so our picture is that as the universe has evolved, it started from nearly homogeneous conditions. The density of the universe was almost the same everywhere in space. Whoops. Uh, but then, over time, gravity acted on slight differences in the density between different locations in space. Regions that were denser than average uh, accrued matter onto them. Regions that were less dense than average uh, became more and more vacuous. And eventually, uh, large-scale structures formed. This kind of web, this thing we call the cosmic web. So this is a computer simulation of the evolution of structure from nearly homogeneous initial conditions to a very uh, inhomogeneous universe that we see today. And in this simulation, the only ingredients are gravity acting on particles and dark matter particles, for example, WIMPs. Uh, they didn't even bother to put in atoms in this, uh, in this simulation because they're a small minority compared to the dark matter. And this simulated universe looks remarkably like that lumpy universe of galaxies that we actually see today. So our picture of the history of the universe is that it started in a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, started expanding very rapidly. That's a period we call cosmic inflation. 
uh, once it had, had reached about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, that's when the, the photons, uh, the radiation in the microwave background, uh, uh, started streaming away from the atoms. And that gives us this picture of the, the microwave background that we saw from Planck. And then over the succeeding billions of years, the small, those small fluctuations in the temperature and density of the universe evolved by a gravity into the large scale structures we see today, galaxies, stars, planets, and larger scale structures. So that's the picture we have now of how the universe has evolved. So we, have, we know the universe is expanding, and it's natural to ask, is the expansion changing over time? What are, so what do we expect? Well, again, gravity is the dominant force on large scales. Uh, and so we can do a simple thought experiment. We're sitting here on the Milky Way. We look at all these other galaxies, these billions of galaxies. They're all receding away from us due to the expansion of the universe. But our galaxy is tugging on each of those galaxies because of gravity. Uh, we're exerting a gravitational force on all those billions of galaxies moving away from us. And therefore, we would expect that if we observed any one of those galaxies next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, the speed with which it's moving away from us should reduce over time. It should, get, it should be slowing down because we're pulling on that galaxy. And so that was the expectation through much of the 20th century was that the expansion should be gradually slowing down over time. Uh, and Hubble and his, uh, many of the people he uh, taught and worked with and who followed him tried to measure that slowing down of the cosmic expansion uh, and never could, could do it because it was, uh, the measurements are, are very challenging to make. And then in the late 1990, two teams of astronomers studying distant supernovae in fact found that the expansion was not slowing down. They both found evidence that it was in fact speeding up over time. Uh, and this was uh, led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011 uh, for the leaders of those two teams. So I want to talk a little bit about this discovery and some of its implications. So this is a supernova. This is the kind of uh, event those astronomers were looking at. So this is a, a nearby galaxy. In the lower left, you see what looks like a bright star. That's, in fact, a star in that galaxy which exploded. And about three weeks after it exploded, it became nearly as bright as all the other billions of stars in that galaxy. So supernovae are, are remarkable events. They uh, they go from being uh, fainter than the sun to being brighter than a billion suns over the course of just a few weeks. And then they fade over the course of a few months. Uh, and this is a, uh, a gallery of about 500 supernovae that we discovered uh, in the mid-2000s using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and again, what you do is you look at, all, you make a big survey of the sky, you come back some time later, you look at the same patches of the sky, and you see if there's anything new there. And each of these blue splotches is a new star. It's a supernova that wasn't there when we took the images of those galaxies uh, a few weeks before these. We think, so the, the, these, these supernova that we're looking at are a particular kind of supernova called a type 1a supernovae. And we have good evidence that type 1a supernovae are explosions of what we call white dwarf stars. These are very compact stars. Our sun will eventually, we think, become a white dwarf star once it's finished burning all of its nuclear fuel. And it will become very compact and dense. Uh, and if you have a white dwarf star near another star and either accreting material from it because of gravity or else orbiting another white dwarf star and eventually colliding with it, in both of those cases, the white dwarf the mass of the white dwarf will increase until it reaches the maximum mass, called the Chandrasekhar mass, uh, about 1.4 times the mass of a sun, and then it will explode. It will undergo a thermonuclear explosion. Uh, and it's those explosions and the radiation from those explosions that lead to these supernovae events that we see. And so these two teams of astronomers in the late 1990s, what they could do what they realized was that these supernova, these type 1a supernova explosions, all had about the same brightness. When they, about three weeks after they exploded, they reached their peak brightness and then faded. 
and they, they, had, they had determined that all of these, these supernovae had the same intrinsic luminosity. So they were all like 100 watt light bulbs, obviously much brighter, but all 100 watts, not 80 or 120. And so this means that these, these particular kinds of supernovae are what we call standard candles. And if you know how bright something is, uh, then you can determine how far away it is relative to other supernovae. And so what they were able to plot was essentially, um, they, they, we could tell uh, how big the universe was when they were uh, exploded. That's the redshift. We can tell that from the spectrum of light. And then they used the brightness of the supernovae to essentially tell how far away they were, or alternatively, how far in the past they had exploded. Uh, and what we had expected was something like this black line, that a supernova that went off when the universe was two-thirds its present size would have a particular brightness. But the points there are showing you that instead, uh, a supernova that went off when the universe had a, cer had a certain fraction of its current size was actually about 25% fainter than we expected. And that was the indication that the expansion of the universe is not, is not slowing down due to gravity, but is in fact speeding up. Uh, and that's what led to the Nobel Prize discovery. So why is this a strange phenomenon? Why is this a mystery? Uh, well, you know, whenever you have any kind of object, uh, every time you've taken any object and you've thrown it up and dropped it, um, as soon as, when you, whenever you throw up a ball, as soon as it leaves your hand, it's moving upward, but what's happening? It's slowing down due to gravity. It's, it's attracted to the center of the Earth. As soon as it leaves my hand, it starts to slow down. And because I can't throw very hard, eventually it reaches some maximum height and then falls back down to Earth. And every time you've thrown a ball up, that's what's happened. Uh, and that's because gravity is attractive. Um, so, but what the universe is doing, it's sort of like, imagine I throw this ball up, and initially it starts slowing down due to gravity, but then at some point, instead of continuing to slow down and eventually hitting a maximum point and falling back to Earth, instead it starts to speed up and rockets out of the atmosphere of the Earth into uh, you know, outer space. That's what the universe is doing. Safe to say we've never seen that in our everyday experience, uh, but that's why the acceleration of the expansion, the speed up of cosmic expansion, uh, is a mystery. It's because it, it confounds our understanding of gravity. So what could be causing this speed up of the expansion of the universe? And we basically think there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that the universe is filled with some kind of stuff that gives rise to a kind of repulsive gravity. Gravity is usually attractive in our, our everyday experience, uh, in the solar system, in our galaxy. But perhaps when we're talking about things on cosmic scales, there is some additional stuff in the universe. It's not dark matter. It's not atoms. It must be something else, which has the property that it makes things repel from each other and therefore speed away from each other. We now call this dark energy. Uh, and we think that the universe is 70% dark energy. That's one possibility. The other is that maybe something strange is going on with gravity when we get to cosmic scales. Again, in the Earth, the solar system, our galaxy, uh, gravity obeys Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's attractive force. But again, perhaps when we get to very large scales, uh, gravity uh, behaves in a different way, in such a way that things can accelerate away from each other. So that's the second logical possibility, is that there's something going wrong with our understanding of gravity. So we now have this picture that's been put together just over the last 10, 15 years, that 95% of the universe is dark, doesn't emit with a light or interact with light. So the stuff we see in our everyday world, uh, stuff made of atoms or more fundamentally quarks, that's only 5% of the universe. So the stuff we're trying to figure out the nature of, primarily here at Fermilab and elsewhere, that's only 5% of the universe. Uh, the stuff that we know about, that, that the, the, the laws of physics that we know of. We think 
is this dark matter. It's not made of atoms. It's made perhaps of some new elementary particle. And that's the stuff that's holding galaxies and clusters of galaxies together. And is the engine by which galaxies with gravity by which structure forms in the universe. And then we think the dominant component of the universe, 70%, is this dark energy, this gravitationally repulsive stuff that's actually speeding up the expansion of the universe. Uh, dark energy is not, it's not something we observe in our everyday life. It has no tangible effects, again, on terrestrial, uh, terrestrial scales. It's much too dilute, too weak a force. So it would only come into play on cosmic scales. Uh, let me skip over that. So one interesting thing is um, I said that the universe today, we think, is about 70% dark energy. That's the, if you look on the right-hand column, uh, about 20% dark matter, about 4 or 5% atomic uh, uh, ordinary matter. But if we go back in time, uh, then those relative amounts of those different components uh, are, will change. We think that as the universe expands, um, dark matter becomes more dilute. Ordinary matter becomes more dilute because as things get, you know, as the distance between them gets bigger, the density, the mass per unit volume goes down. But that doesn't happen with dark energy. Uh, so since dark energy is dominating today, uh, as the universe, uh, we think that the density of dark energy hasn't changed very much from today to earlier times. And that means if I go back in time when the, when the universe was denser, higher density of dark matter and ordinary matter, that means dark energy was relatively less important. So if I go back to a time nine and a half billion years after the Big Bang, the middle column there, then we think the universe was about 50% dark energy, 43% or so dark matter, 7% ordinary matter. And if I go even further back in time, so just a billion years after the Big Bang, then we think dark energy was only 1%. Dark matter was the dominant component, 84%. Ordinary matter, about 15%. And this is important because remember I showed you that movie of structure forming by gravity. That only works in a universe where the bulk of the stuff is dark matter. Once dark energy tr takes over, from, becomes more dominant than dark matter, Structure can no longer form because dark energy is this repulsive force pushing things away from each other where gravity was the thing pulling them together. Uh, so we think that before, uh, you know, a few billion years, the universe actually was slowing down due to the gravity of dark matter. Uh, and then maybe seven, eight, nine billion years after the Big Bang, uh, dark matter became sufficiently dilute that dark energy took over and cause the universe to speed up. So what is dark energy? Well, we don't know. Uh, we think it's a component with negative pressure. Uh, and that's what we need in general relativity to make something which would be gravitationally repulsive. But we really don't have a good fundamental understanding of what dark energy is. Our most conservative hypothesis is that it's the energy of empty space itself, the vacuum. So if I take some. This, if I took this bottle of water, poured all the water out of it, put a vacuum hose uh, on it, evacuated all the air from it, shielded it from cosmic rays, um, uh, there would be no particles left in it, no ordinary matter. I could shield it from dark matter. Uh, and it would be empty space. In classical physics, empty space would have no energy. But in quantum physics, ener empty space has energy due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And so, and it turns out that in quantum mechanics, the vacuum, the energy of the vacuum would have the right properties to be dark energy. It would have this gravitationally repulsive effect. Uh, so that's the most uh, conservative hypothesis. Uh, now, the only slight problem with that uh, hypothesis is that if I calculate how much energy uh, there is in the vacuum in this little bottle of water, it's infinity. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's not an infinite amount of energy inside this bottle. So that means that our calculations are wrong. And this has, in fact, been a major embarrassment for theoretical physics for the last century. Uh, we just don't have an understanding of why the vacuum, the energy of, the, of empty space, 
is not infin infinity or much larger than we observe it to be. So it's still a fundamental mystery. There are other suggestions for what the dark energy could be. Uh, one popular idea is that perhaps the energy of the dark energy is associated with a much, much lighter cousin of the Higgs boson, a different kind of field permeating the universe. Uh, but those ideas are even uh, much more speculative. Uh, and so I thought what I would do would be, uh, you know, when you don't have the answer to something, you ask Siri. Um, so Siri, what do you think the nature of dark energy is? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't answer that. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was worth a shot. <clears throat> okay. I think Apple should be, should be working on this better. But. Okay. All right, so we don't know what dark energy is. Siri doesn't even know what dark energy is. Nevertheless, dark energy is important. Why is it important? Well, the nature of dark energy is going to determine the future evolution of the universe. It's already 70% of the universe. I said it was less, a smaller fraction in the past. That means in the future, dark energy is going to be an increasing fraction of the universe. So it's dominating now. It's going to dominate, we think, into the future. And so we need to understand its properties if we were to have any hope of determining what the future evolution of the universe is going to be. Uh, and one way to do that, to understand the nature of dark energy, is to make maps of the universe. They can give us clues to what dark energy is. Uh, and so that leads me into the project uh, I've been working on with colleagues here and around the world for a number of years called the Dark Energy Survey. And our basic goal is to make a map of the universe to try to understand the history of the expansion of the universe and the history of this growth of the clumpiness of the universe in order to get at the properties of dark energy or whatever is causing the universe to speed up. And so what we've done is we've built a camera for a telescope in Chile, and we're now conducting two surveys of the universe, taking pictures, snapshots, of eventually 300 million galaxies over about one-eighth of the sky. And we're also taking snapshots of certain smaller regions of the sky which we go back to and point in the same direction roughly every week to, to discover these, more of these supernovae. The Nobel Prize work was based on um, uh, observations of just a few tens of supernovae. In this project, we're going to have observations of thousands of supernovae and hundreds of millions of galaxies. So we started, uh, the survey started in late August of 2013. It's been, we just finished our third observing season. Uh, it's supported in the United States by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. So this is your tax dollars at work, uh, and we are trying to spend them wisely. We also have foreign and institutional partners who have contributed to the project. And uh, we're using this, this map to try to understand the history of cosmic expansion and the growth of structure using four primary techniques. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but I'll just list them. One is to study these clusters of galaxies and to actually take a census of clusters, count how many of them there are in a given volume of space. A second is this technique of gravitational lensing that I mentioned before, look at the distortions of the shapes of distant galaxies as their light passes through the foreground distribution of dark matter. A third technique is just to measure the distribution of galaxies in space, what we call large-scale structure. And the fourth is the technique that led to the discovery of cosmic acceleration, these supernovae, but just to measure many more of them, measure them more precisely, and measure them to greater distances. Um, so I think I'll skip, well, yeah. So I'll just, I'll just mention one of these four techniques. This is weak gravitational lensing. So again, the idea here is we're measuring the shapes of very distant galaxies. The light from those galaxies is traveling towards us through this foreground distribution of dark matter, halos of dark matter associated with galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Uh, and as it travels through them, the light paths get bent. That's what Einstein's general relativity tells us. And that slight bending leads to slight distortions of the shapes of those galaxies. Before, I showed you very pronounced distortions of the shapes of galaxies. That's what we call strong lensing. 
Uh, but that only happens to a minority of distant galaxies if they happen to be just near the line of sight to some foreground galaxy. All galaxies, all distant galaxies, get weakly distorted, weakly lensed. Uh, and so we can measure this uh, by using the shapes of these 200 million distant galaxies. And that will give us uh, information on dark energy. Um, so we, in order to do this project, we've built an international collaboration. Uh, we have 400 scientists from around the world. Uh, the project is led uh, by a team here at Fermilab in the US. But we have collaborators in England and in Europe, Brazil uh, and Australia. And we use uh, this telescope. This is the Blanco Telescope on Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. This is operated by the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. It's in the northern uh, Andes Mountains of no northern Chile. So inside, these are three different telescopes. The biggest one is that one with the silver dome in the middle. Uh, if you go inside that dome, this is what you see. Uh, so on the left, that big structure is the telescope itself. Uh, and what you see here is the mirror of the telescope. It has a diameter about four yards across, four meters. And so light comes in from the sky, bounces off of that mirror, and then goes up into our camera, which is this thing in the upper right. It actually goes through five different lenses, which focus the light onto a big digital camera that's about this big around. Uh, so this is what the actual focal plane of the camera looked like. It's 570 million pixels. That doesn't sound like so much today. You know, your iPhone has 10 million pixels, but 10, 12 years ago uh, sounded like more. And these are very special pixels. Uh, they're very sensitive to light. So when I take a picture um, of all of you with my, uh, with my camera, um, uh, well, it has a flat. We don't have a flash. Uh, it cost $40 million and they couldn't put a flash on it. But, uh, uh, but the point is your, you know, your iPhone takes great photos, but it needs light. Even, you know, even this amount of light, it doesn't do so well in. Uh, but the universe is dark, right? 95% of it is dark. We're looking at these very distant, faint galaxies. We get very few photons in, uh, in the, the minute and a half that we, that we open our shutter. Very few photons per distant galaxy. And so these pixels have to be extremely sensitive. Uh, so we operate them at very low temperature, uh, and they have very low noise compared to your, uh, your digital cameras. Uh, and so this uh, is a, a very finely tuned instrument. It was built here at Fermilab and installed on the telescope in 2012. And in fact, so on the right is a picture of the camera installed at the top end of the telescope. And you see at the top end of the telescope has those white rings. Uh, and before we took the, the camera down to Chile, you know, it's, it's a remote mountaintop. Uh, we knew this would be a complex operation to install it. They hadn't actually removed the top end of the telescope in many decades. And so here at Fermilab, uh, we decided to build a replica of the top end of the telescope. We call it a telescope simulator. So these white rings here uh, have the same diameter as the rings at the top end of the telescope. Uh, but this big telescope simulator was out uh, in one of the laboratories here on site just a couple of miles away. And so we were able to put the camera together here, mounted on this telescope simulator, uh, understand how to mount it and uh, uh, how it would work under various orientations. And that proved enormously beneficial uh, when we went down to, to Chile to install it. Uh, it has, as I mentioned, five lenses. On the upper right is the biggest of the five lenses. It's nearly a meter across, uh, so quite large optics, very precisely shaped. Uh, and then once the light goes through those, those five lenses, before it hits the digital camera focal plane itself, it goes through a filter. Uh, and we operate with five different filters at different times uh, that let in either blue light or sort of mid-range optical light or near infrared light. Uh, and these are very large optical filters, some of the largest ever built for astronomy. Uh, and the remarkable story here is that these filters, uh, they, they are very difficult to manufacture. Uh, and they were made by this company in Japan 
uh, just a few months after the uh, tsunami of 2011 devastated the country. So a remarkable, a remarkable feat. Uh, so this is what an actual raw image from the camera looks like. So you know when you take, if you have a nice digital SLR, those, those different formats, JPEG, whatever, raw. Uh, so we, we only use the raw mode here. We don't, uh, we don't make, use other modes in the camera. Uh, and so this is what a raw image looks like. It's got, and so each of these is, uh, is a charge couple device detector, 2,000 by 4,000 pixels. Uh, and uh, we mosaic them together to make the focal plane. Uh, and so you can see, uh, you know, galaxies, stars in our own galaxy, various sorts of artifacts. So a lot of work goes into uh, cleaning those images of artifacts so that we can use them for astronomy. So this is one of the first images we took uh, on the night of September 12th, 2012 of a nearby cluster of galaxies, the Fornax cluster. Uh, and you can see these little uh, black, uh, blackened areas. Those are the uh, divisions between those different charge couple device detectors and the focal plane. If I just zoom in on one of those CCDs and blow it up, this shows you one of the most prominent galaxies in the Fornax cluster, NGC 1365. Beautiful spiral galaxy. Uh, so this camera has uh, one of the features uh, that enables us to make this very large survey is that it covers a very wide field of view on the sky. It's three square degrees on the sky. Uh, so to give you a sense of scale, if we were to point it at the full moon, we could completely encapsulate the full moon. Whereas the Hubble Space Telescope, its cameras you know, just cover a very small portion of the sky in any one, uh, in any one picture. So it's a very wide field camera, which is what we want to be able to make a map over a very large swath of the universe. So each year, for about five months of the year, we just take snapshots around the sky, about 20,000 of them each year. Uh, so this is uh, another example of one of the images we've taken, NGC 1512. So it's about 38 million light years away. So this is a relatively nearby galaxy. Most of the things we're interested in studying for dark energy are these very faint, much more distant galaxies that are billions of light years away. Uh, here's another example. I don't remember the phone number of this, this galaxy. Here's a cluster of galaxies. So you see a number of sort of galaxies of a similar color in a relatively small volume of space. Uh, here's uh, a number of what look like interacting galaxies. Uh, and to give you a sense of scale, this image, which is just from a portion of one of the images, contains about 50,000 galaxies in it. Uh, and so that's what we need in order to be able to make a map of hundreds of millions of galaxies over time. If I just blow that one up and then you zoom in, you see there is a distant cluster of galaxies. So these are the kinds of things we're counting uh, in order to probe uh, cosmic acceleration and dark energy. We've also discovered a number of uh, strong lensing systems. So these are, again, distant galaxies that are highly distorted because the light from them has passed by a near a foreground galaxy or cluster of galaxies uh, and led to this strong distortion of the images. Uh, this is an actual map of dark matter in a cluster of galaxies similar to the one I showed you before, again, using this weak lensing technique. So the image is an image of the cluster of galaxies. Uh, so you see these galaxies here are all in this foreground cluster. The colored contours are actually showing you the mass uh, distribution of that cluster inferred from this gravitational lensing technique. So the red contours indicate a high density of mass. The bluer is a lower density. So we're using this technique to, again, map out the dark matter in these systems. Uh, the other thing I mentioned, we're also using this survey to find supernovae. And so here's one example. If I take, so again, this is that picture of the Fornax cluster. I'll zoom in on one particular CCD and blow it up, and then focus on the lower portion of that CCD and blow it up, on, focus it on this one particular galaxy. Uh, and then if I flip back and forth between two pictures of that galaxy <coughs> taken a few weeks apart, then you see something has appeared 
Uh, and that's a new supernova that we discovered in October of 2013. And we've now discovered well over 1,000 of these supernovae. Uh, supernovae can be hard to, to see. Uh, you know, you can, if you're sitting up front, you can probably see it. If you're sitting far away, it's harder to see. But uh, fortunately, they come with these green arrows. Um, <laughs> that makes it much easier to find them. <clears throat> OK. So, uh, so this is actually the geometry of our survey, the footprint of the survey on the sky. So this is a picture of the sky in celestial coordinates, the coordinate system defined by the rotating Earth. Uh, the plane of our galaxy, of the stars rotating our galaxy, is this dotted line. We want to stay away from that. Because if we have to look through the plane of our galaxy, a lot of the light's going to be absorbed and scattered by gas and dust in our galaxy. So we want to look outside of the plane, away from the plane of our galaxy. So that tells us we want to focus in this region of the sky. Uh, and then we also want to see what we can see overhead from Chile at night. Uh, and that's, uh, that's this, uh, so we focused in on this kind of uh, purplish, reddish, pinkish, region here. So this is a, a region that covers about one-eighth of the total sky. Uh, and what we're doing over the course of these five years is just taking many snapshots through each of those five filters over this whole area of sky uh, and making deeper and deeper maps. The yellow, the little yellow regions, those are where the supernova fields, those are the ones that we come back and we point in those directions roughly once a week to discover supernovae and measure their brightnesses. Uh, and then the data that we've mostly analyzed so far is in this green patch. This is data we took before we actually started the survey when we were kind of testing things out. We called that science verification. So this is now a map of the galaxies of a couple of million galaxies from that greenish uh, area over in the lower right. Uh, and again, you see this kind of filamentary structure of, galaxy, of the galaxy distribution uh, showing you the large scale cosmic web. Uh, again, this, this region of the sky is only 3% of the area that we will eventually cover. Uh, this is actually a map of the dark matter in that same region of the sky using this weak gravitational lensing technique. Uh, and there's a nice correlation between where the dark matter is and where the galaxies are. That's not surprising. We think galaxies in the cosmic web mostly trace out where the dark matter is. But we can now actually make maps of it using this lensing technique. This is now a more recent map that we've made. This covers about 1,000 square degrees. This is from the first of our five seasons. And this is the data that we're now analyzing. So this is, again, showing you the distribution of, of a few tens of millions of galaxies over the sky. You see this, frothamentary, this frothy filamentary structure of the cosmic web. Uh, and compare that to the region we've already analyzed. It's, it's a much larger data set uh, that we now have to play with. One of the things we've done uh, is, in addition to using this data to probe dark energy, we can also use it to probe dark matter. And so here is a map showing you, our, again, that, that pinkish footprint on the sky, now superimposed on a picture of the southern sky from the telescope. Uh, and the little red dots are, are nearby galaxies that we discovered just last year. These are galaxies that are in our own cosmic backyard. These are dwarf galaxies. They're ultra-faint. Some of them may contain only 1,000 stars or so, compared to the billions of stars in a typical galaxy. And these are satellites of our own Milky Way galaxy, much like the large and small Magellanic clouds are satellites of our Milky Way. But these are much, much smaller, much fainter. And so we simply haven't been able to discover them until we've made this map. So we discovered 17 of these nearby dwarf gal galaxies uh, just last year. And as I said, these, these little faint galaxies have the advantage that they're relatively nearby to us, to the Milky Way, and they're very rich in dark matter. They contain very few stars, mostly dark matter. Um, and so we're searching in these dwarf galaxies to try to see the signal of that annihilation of weakly interacting massive particles. So this is now a gamma ray image from the Fermi gamma ray satellite of one of those uh, dwarf galaxies that we discovered last year. We don't see any significant excess uh, uh, of gamma rays coming from that galaxy, 
So that allows us to put constraints on the nature of dark matter. And finally, a couple of other sort of fun things that have come out of this, nothing to do with dark energy or dark matter. Uh, but when you take, make a large map of the sky, it turns out to be useful for a variety of other things that we hadn't even thought of when we designed uh, and started the survey. Namely, we can use this, we think, to understand more about the nature of our own solar system, the very nearby universe. So in the upper left is showing you the inner solar system, the sun surrounded by the inner planets, then the asteroids, and then Jupiter. In the upper right, we're zooming out to see the outer solar system, including Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, the former planet. Uh, which we now realize is just one of a very large number of objects uh, that we call Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, and in the lower right, uh, we have a zoom out even further, uh, so the, the solar system is now all contained in here. And in red is the uh, orbit of uh, an interesting planet called Sedna that was discovered a number of years ago. Uh, and Sedna, we think, is sort of uh, has to do with, uh, and then if we go out even further, we get to where we think there's this vast cloud of, uh, of stuff called the, the, the Oort cloud. Uh, and so it turns out that there's actually many hundreds of thousands, uh, not only of inner solar system asteroids, but these uh, Kuiper belt objects and more generally what we call trans-Neptunian objects, things outside the orbit of Neptune. Uh, and so here is a plot on the sky of the known trans-Neptunian objects super on the sky, superimposed on the footprint of our survey. And then this is the orbits that they tr would trace out over a period of five years. Uh, and so basically, this curve is just tracing out the plane of orbits of planets in the solar system around the sun. Uh, but you can see that a number of these things uh, should be within the footprint of our survey, and we should be able to, to detect them because they move around over time within our survey. So if we take pictures over the course of five years over our footprint, we'll see some of these objects move around, and we'll be able to trace out these trans-Neptunian objects and learn more about the solar system. And in particular, these supernova fields are very good for that because we observe them roughly once a week, and so over the last few years, we've detected a number of these new trans-Neptunian objects by looking for things that move over the course of weeks or months uh, through these fields over time. And so this is a listing of all the new trans-Neptunian objects we had discovered as of last year. There was a lot of excitement in the astronomy community a month or two ago uh, because two uh, two astronomers postulated the existence of a new planet, you've probably heard about it, called Planet Nine. This is a planet that would um, have about 10 times the mass of the Earth, and it's postulated because of the regularity of, an, of, of the orbits of a number of these uh, trans-Neptunian objects, including a couple that were found with our camera. And uh, we've been quite excited about this because if Planet Nine truly exists, uh, we think there's a good chance this is the likely orbit. Uh, the, the orbit of this object uh, is constrained by uh, actually studies of the Cassini satellite orbiting around Saturn. If there was any additional mass out there, it would show up uh, as a perturbation of that orbit. And so the most likely uh, range of orbit for this planet nine directly crosses our survey footprint. So we have people on our team now trying to use our data to see if we can see any trace of this possible hypothetical new planet. And finally, uh, you, as, was, as Andre mentioned, uh, there was a lot of excitement last month with the announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves. This is a uh, sort of warping of space-time um, that was predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity 100 years ago, uh, and basically, uh, what they discovered was the signal, the chirp, due to two black holes, each 30 times the mass of the sun, orbiting each other and eventually spiraling in and merging. And that's a very uh, uh, violent event from the point of view of space-time. It sends out these ripples of space-time, 
which were observed by the LIGO experiment using these two uh, huge detectors, one in Washington State, the other in Louisiana. Um, and uh, this is uh, quite exciting, and LIGO is now is going to turn on again later this year. Uh, and we realized that LIGO was going to be turning on last year, and so we formed a project using this, our camera and our survey such that when LIGO said, they, gee, we think we maybe have seen something, we would go and point our camera in the direction of the sky where they thought it was coming from and see if we could see an optical light counterpart to these gravity waves. Now, the problem is that with only two detectors, one in Washington and one in Louisiana, um, you, they couldn't determine very precisely where on the sky these gravity waves were coming from. To triangulate, to really determine uh, the, the uh, direction precisely, you need three points of a triangle. They only had two. And so they had a rather large uncertainty in where on the sky this was. And so within a couple of days, we pointed our camera at the most likely region of sky uh, where LIGO said they thought they saw this event. Uh, and we were searching for an optical counterpart. We didn't see anything. That's not too surprising because um, uh, if, you, if there are black holes merging together, it's unlikely that you would form something that would give off optical light. However, in the future, LIGO will, will be sensitive not only to black holes merging, but also to neutron stars merging. And we think there's a good chance that when neutron stars collide together, they would give off optical light. So we will hopefully continue this program in the future. It kind of piggybacks on the survey that we're carrying out. Uh, and synergizes with it in a nice way. And so our hope is that in the next year, perhaps, we may be able to discover optical counterparts for gravitational wave events for the first time. This is a picture of the Orion Nebula. Uh, we didn't, this was taken with the dark energy camera. It has nothing to do with cosmology, but I thought it was a pretty picture. <laughs> uh, and this also has nothing to do with cosmology. This is a comet. Uh, so, you know, when we're pointing the, we basically, a computer tells us where to point the camera on any given time and any given night. Our computer doesn't know about comets, uh, and so there just happened to be this uh, quite bright comet, Comet Lovejoy, that was passing through while we took the picture, and so it makes a nice pretty picture. All right, to summarize, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. It's about 95% dark, 25% dark matter, which holds galaxies and clusters together. There's going to be a quiz at the end. About 70% dark energy. It's filled with billions of galaxies and clusters of galaxies that are mostly dark matter. It's expanding from a Big Bang uh, that we've known for quite a while. For the last 18 years or so, we've known that that expansion is actually speeding up. We don't know why, but it's likely due to this dark energy, which makes up 70% of the universe. And with the Dark Energy Survey and other surveys that will follow onto it, uh, we're embarked on this journey to address this mystery, to try to understand, uh, learn more about the history of the expansion of the universe, and therefore hopefully learn more about the future evolution of the cosmos. Thank you.